Welcome everyone. Grateful to have you all here for a continuation of our interprofessional mini conference, Safety in Practice, Protecting the Public. Uh, this morning we got to hear a little bit around the creation of a safety registry. We just got to hear a little bit about the importance of the candidacy program and mentorship as part of protecting the public, as part of reducing burnout, improving opportunities to navigate and think through the complexity of social work practice, the complexity of the ways in which we try to um, serve the public and protect um, uh, everyone. And we also got a chance to talk about the concept of safety and the ways in which that is connected to decolonizing our practice. And we saw how the concept of unique disciplines that don't interact, how that aligns with decolonizing theory. And uh, so today, as part of that, we have the opportunity to learn from one another. The concept of interprofessional collaborative practice as we discussed this morning is uh, part of decolonizing our practice. And so very excited to get to have this panel discussion where we're going to learn about how interdisciplinary care can reduce the risk of medical error and provider burnout. And we're going to have a chance to learn from three doctors and an engineer who are going to be speaking about ways to reimagine interprofessional collaboration to provide safer care. And so I'm going to, we're going to begin with Dr. Jeffrey Goldberg, who um, I got to meet and learn from and work with, um, he was the chief medical officer when I was first working in uh, hospitals and uh, got to work together with him and learn from him around the concept of just culture and uh, safety culture and safety principles. And everything that I learned from Dr. Goldberg continues to inform everything that I do every single day here and so I'm really excited that everyone else gets a chance to learn from him. So without further ado, Dr. Goldberg, welcome. So grateful to get to learn from you. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to the conference. Uh, it's uh, uh, great to, uh, to be able to, to join your program. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen because you know, as, as a doctor, we can't, uh, let's see. Right and I might invite you to turn your camera off just to ensure the that we hear your you're in the okay. you've got some hospital uh, Wi-Fi and we all can empathize. So right. Perfect. So, we see it perfectly. Um, we hear you perfectly. Oh, okay, great. Um, well, Naj asked me this this morning to speak about uh, patient safety, uh, just culture. Uh, transparency, uh, change in the healthcare system. Uh, and she said, by the way, can you keep it all under about 15 minutes? So you're going to get the, the whirlwind tour. <laughs> so, so bear with me, but, but here we go. Um, our, our journey here, let me see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. So our, our journey here really understands or starts with an understanding of just how dangerous a place hospitals and healthcare facilities can be. Uh, we, we all kind of know inherently that there's, there's a risk to everything that we do, uh, certainly when we talk to patients about risks and benefits of treatment. Um, but I'm not sure that even today, everyone really inherently understands um, the, the level of risk that we encounter every day as we take care of patients. Um, if we worked in an environment like uh, nuclear power generation or we were uh, firefighters or, or uh, worked on an aircraft carrier, I think everybody would easily recognize that we work in a dangerous environment. Uh, but if you look at the statistics, uh, healthcare is actually at least as dangerous as any of those environments and in, in some ways more so. Um, this was something we came to appreciate about 25 years ago when what was then called the Institute of Medicine in the United States uh, published a, a landmark report based on available data that estimated that there were upwards of 100,000 people a year dying in U.S. hospitals of preventable medical errors. 
and they found this, this uh, statistic to be absolutely shocking. Um, to put it in perspective, the report pointed out that this would be equivalent to a jumbo jet crashing every single day, killing everyone on board and pointing out that no one would ever tolerate that in the aviation industry. And certainly the aviation industry has made tremendous strides in safety, uh, but they felt that, that if this is what we were experiencing in healthcare, this should be absolutely unacceptable to society. And after they issued the report, they basically sat back and waited for what they felt would be the inevitable uproar and uh, the sense of this, this must be fixed and we have to do something. And unfortunately, this report landed with a big thud, uh, mostly because nobody really wanted to believe the data. Uh, as we looked around in our own personal experience, we might see that you know every once in a while something bad happened, but most people would go through the system and you know everybody seemed to, to muddle through okay. Occasionally there were some errors, but you know mostly things got fixed. And I suppose that if, if you were actually losing a jumbo jet every day, um, you could look around and see, well, you know, almost every uh, one of the other thousand or so flights made it okay. You know, every once in a while, something just isn't going to go right. Um, but in reality, that, that's unacceptable in aviation, and it should be unacceptable in healthcare. And when uh, people went back and re-looked at the data about 15 years later, uh, there was an excellent report that came out by James in the Journal of Patient Safety um, that looked at the latest data and showed that instead of it getting better, it actually seemed to be getting worse. Uh, there were upwards of over 400,000 patient deaths a year if you included outpatient care as well as inpatient care. Uh, just inpatient care alone was over 200,000 deaths a year twice what had been estimated by the original report. If this data is accurate, and there's no reason to doubt it because these were very well done studies, um, that would make medical errors the third leading cause of death in the US and responsible or contributing to about one out of every six deaths. And I don't think that those of us who work in healthcare really innately ab absorb this level of involvement in medical error. Um, does this apply to Canada? Unfortunately, Canada doesn't have as much data as we do in the US, uh, but what is available leads us to believe that Canada is in a pretty similar situation. Uh, this was data from a study that was uh, done across pharmacies in Nova Scotia that over an eight year period uh, found um, almost 100,000 errors. Uh, most of those, four out of every five, were considered near misses, meaning uh, somebody started to make an error, but fortunately caught it before it went anywhere. About 17,000 actually went through and an error was made, but didn't harm the patient. There were almost a thousand that got through that caused some degree of harm to the patient, including 10 that caused severe harm or death. So this is very much like an iceberg where um, the tip of the iceberg is fortunately pretty small, but it's supported by a very broad base where there's a lot of errors that go on. Unfortunately, you can never pick out which one of those is gonna go nowhere and which one of those is gonna go forward to seriously hurt a patient. So if we wanna keep from hurting patients, we have to have systems in place that can prevent all of these or at least trap or mitigate them. So why are we doing so badly? Uh, because if you look again at those other industries that uh, we know are inherently dangerous. If you look at aircraft carrier operations or nuclear power generation, uh, fortunately, accidents are very, very rare. In fact, in some industries that are considered dangerous, um, they go years without accidents. Uh, the aviation industry goes years at a time without a single fatality now from a major accident. And yet we're doing very poorly in healthcare. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is that unlike those other industries, we have very limited infrastructure for safety improvement. Um, unlike a nuclear regulatory commission or um, an aviation governing body, we have nothing similar in medicine that requires reporting and tracking of errors and uh, development of safety systems. We also have a culture that is not attuned towards making our system safer. 
we have a, a paradigm that has been termed a shame and blame culture. Um, if there's an error, if something bad happens from it, um, our, our uh, way of dealing with it is to find out who or what was responsible, blame that individual. And in the US in particular, we have a very robust tort system um, where you see ads on TV all the time that uh, lawyers are, are promising to quote, make them pay for what they did, uh, whether it's, it's car accidents or healthcare or what have you. So historically, uh, when an error occurs and somebody gets hurt, uh, we deal with it by trying to quote, figure out what went wrong, which in, re which in reality means um, who's at fault, who did what, uh, who did something that they messed up and, and uh, caused some harm. And then once we figure that out, we retrain people, often we discipline people for making an error. Uh, we might update some policies and procedures and uh, we'll, we'll maybe improve some signage or some superficial changes like that that all sound like a good idea. But then we'll say, okay, you know, problem solved and we think we fixed the extent of it. The reason that doesn't work is because we live with a couple of myths. The first myth is that if we try hard enough, we won't make any mistakes. All you have to do is be very, very careful and you won't make any errors. And the second myth is that if we punish people hard enough when they do make errors, they'll be more careful and so they'll make fewer errors. And unfortunately, neither of these things is true. The reality is that everybody makes errors. It's part of normal human behavior. You do it all the time, you do it repeatedly. No one does it on purpose, but it's just who we are. It's part of being human as opposed to being a robot or a computer. Errors are not misconduct. They're not uh, carelessness. They're not anything that anybody did wrong. It's just part of who you are. And if that sounds unnatural to you, uh, think about all the times that you've ever left the house and you forgot your car keys, or you forgot your grocery list, or you forgot your purse, or you forgot to pick up somebody you were supposed to pick up. We've all done these things, and nobody did them on purpose. In fact, we did them in spite of the fact that we understood that it was really important that we not make those errors, and yet from time to time, we've all done them anyway. And that's just because it's part of being humans. And so if it's impossible to prevent errors when you rely just on human behavior, and that means that if you're going to prevent error or avoid error or, or mitigate error, you have to have systems in place that recognize that human beings make errors, that that's normal human behavior. And that concept that medical errors result from an imperfect system as opposed to imperfect people is a transformative paradigm. <clears throat> so if medical errors occur because we have deficiencies in our system, then it makes no sense to be punishing people for normal human behavior of making errors. And if you wanna keep patients safe, then the key is not to change human behavior because you can't. The key is to improve the system that we all work in. And that's a really key concept. So our current way of thinking is that medical errors happen when people aren't careful enough. And if everybody just paid close attention to what they were doing, then we wouldn't have a problem. The reality is that medical errors happen because we work in systems that allow people's normal human behavior to have bad consequences and allow patients to get hurt. And turning around and punishing people for that normal human behavior isn't going to do anything to help patient safety. Now, there are leaders in healthcare who say, wait a minute, you're telling me I'm not supposed to hold people responsible for their actions. And that's really not what we're talking about here. Um, everybody understands that when you work in healthcare, there's an assumed degree of professionalism. Uh, there are rules that we all have to follow. We're not saying that people need to be held entirely blameless for any action. They just need to be held blameless for normal human behavior. So in order to merge those two paradigms and make everybody comfortable with what's acceptable, what's not, there's a concept known as just culture. 
And again, we could have a whole day long seminar on just culture, but I can best summarize it as saying, you can really put things in three buckets. Uh, one is errors that just happen because of normal human behavior. They're going to happen uh, until we have robots taking care of patients. There's no way we can have a healthcare system in which errors are not going to occur when things are done by humans. So if you're going to have that kind of a system, you have to have measures in place that recognize that errors are going to happen. You have to have processes and procedures and system design in place that help keep errors from reaching the patient and causing harm. On the other end of the spectrum, we do have people who will engage in what can be termed reckless behavior. These are people who intentionally take risks that are never acceptable. An example of this would be somebody who says, I've been drinking all night or I've been using drugs, but I'm going to come to work anyway and take care of patients. That's never acceptable, not in any industry, especially not in healthcare. There's no excuse for it. And people need to be held accountable for decisions that are clearly not professional. Most of the errors that we see though that reach patients really fall in an in-between category that you could call at-risk behavior. These are people who may choose to do things that on one level they know is risky uh, outside the rules or outside the norm, but at the same time, they're done with the best of, in best of intentions. Um, you can justify what you're doing because you think the good is greater than the risk. So one example is if you've ever been late for an important appointment, a patient is waiting on you, uh, but you're running late, and so you decide you're going to drive a little faster than the speed limit permits. That is, on the one hand, risky behavior. We know we're not supposed to break the speed limit, and at the same time, in our own minds, we can justify that the benefits outweigh the risks involved. In reality, what we want to do is remove those incentives to do the wrong thing. Uh, one example, for example, uh, when uh, uh, Naj and I were working uh, at a hospital in Louisville, we would find situations where nurses would often skip the step uh, that involves scanning a patient's barcode on their wrist before giving them a medication. And it wasn't because they didn't believe in that safety system. Uh, they knew that medication errors could be a problem and that uh, double checking to make sure they had the right patient and the right drug by using the barcode scanners was important. And yet we found numerous instances where they were choosing not to do it. And if you simply ask why, what was the motivation for doing something that on the surface you know is not the right thing to do, uh, the answer came back, well, you know, the printers aren't working correctly to print the barcodes, and often it's hard to scan the barcodes. And uh, instead of making a patient wait for their pain medicine or other things that they needed urgently, they would just bypass the safety system and hit override. And even though they knew it was defeating an important system, uh, the ends justify the, the means in their mind. So the key here is not punishing people for breaking rules. The key is redesigning the system so that you remove that incentive to break the rules. So how do we go about making these kind of changes in the system? Because the people who this affects the most, besides the patients who get impacted, are those of us who are directly involved with patient care. And our healthcare system, or really any, any system, can often be uh, looked at, as, at a, in this diagram as a sharp end and a blunt end. The sharp end is everybody who's on the front lines actually dealing with a patient. And if there's an error and that causes harm to a patient, those of us at the sharp end of the diagram are the ones that uh, bear the brunt of that in terms of, of experiencing the harm to the patient, and its impact on caregiver burnout and morale um, and, and the quality of care that we can provide to other patients. And yet the people on the sharp end of the stick are the ones who have the least influence in changing the system. Um, if you wanna change the system and the processes that we use, um, that comes from people and from entities that tend to sit at the blunt end uh, that's hospital leadership and management, boards of trustees, um, state and provincial and federal regulators. Um, that's where this kind of change needs to come from, even though those entities are often 
farthest removed from some of the impacts of errors that reach patients. So Naj tells me that we have a, a mixed audience today. Some of you are directly involved in patient care. Uh, for those of you that uh, have jobs that reside more at the blunt end of the system diagram, um, this is really for you uh, to implore you to work on how do we work on changing systems uh, to help prevent errors from reaching patients. So how do we bring about that change from the blunt end? Leadership has to set the example. Um, this is something that requires buy-in from everybody. Naj mentioned the importance of a team approach and a multidisciplinary approach. Um, safety is not uh, the responsibility of the safety department in your healthcare system. It's everyone's responsibility. Uh, those people who work full-time or part-time in safety are there to help you help design a safer system and work within that system. Um, but real change, meaningful change, only happens from the top down. Uh, what are some of the kind of things that we recommend for uh, health system leadership and, and governance? Uh, one is rewarding transparency. Um, we can only implement changes in the system if we know where the problems are. Uh, there's a natural tendency to hide our mistakes because of the shame and blame culture that we live in. Unless we create an environment where people are rewarded for actually reporting errors and harm that occurred so that system can be redesigned, we're not going to improve our system. Uh, one example of this that Naj asked me to talk about is, is uh, safety huddles that we did at our previous hospital. Um, every weekday morning at 10 a.m., um, every department head in the hospital, whether it was engineering or all the nursing units, pharmacy, billing, everybody, um, got together in one room and reported out all of the safety problems they had experienced over the last 24 hours and as best as possible what the apparent causes were and what the recommended remedies were. And that was a, a system that allowed us to uh, share our various problems. Everybody learned from everybody else's errors and could help implement uh, changes system-wide. Um, this only worked because hospital leadership encouraged the department heads to be very forthcoming with everything that was going on. Uh, in fact, we rewarded people as best as possible. The more items they could report at our morning safety huddle, um, the, the better off we all were. Um, so again, it's about leadership encouraging a culture of transparency. Uh, definitely, we want to have a system of just culture where we don't discipline people for normal human behavior and making human errors. In fact, we need to recognize that when that happens, um, there is a second victim in a medical error, and that's the caregiver that was involved in the error. So if the first victim was the patient who was harmed, um, the person who was at the very tip of the sharp end of that, that spear uh, who actually um, was the one that was most proximate to the error involving the patient uh, is, is often uh, very negatively impacted by that area. And you need to have a system in place that offers consolation and support uh, and, uh, and helps prevent uh, caregiver burnout when people are involved with errors because it just happens to be their turn. We need to focus on eliminating at-risk behavior, not by changing people, but by changing the system that they work in. So if there are things in your system that cause people to deviate from what they're supposed to be doing or the way you think things are supposed to be working, you need to be able to identify those and redesign your system. Uh, I've worked in systems where people really prided themselves um, on their ability to do workarounds. You know, we work in an environment where there's all kinds of challenges, things don't work right. Uh, but we have tremendous resiliency where we can always come up with an alternative solution and, and do a workaround to a problem all the time. Um, that's, that's on the one hand something to be proud of for your ability, but on the other hand, uh, every time you have a workaround, it's a big red flag for something being wrong with your system that promotes unsafe care. Uh, and of course, we do need to have accountability for reckless behavior. Uh, people want to know that they work in a system where they're surrounded by other professionals uh, who uh, hold, hold themselves to the highest standards, and reckless behavior is simply not going to be permitted. 
Um, obviously, this is a very short talk about a lot of information. Um, there's a lot of books out there that covers this information, but one that I, I would really strongly urge everybody to read uh, because I do believe it will change your, your thinking and your perspective on how we approach this is a book by David Marks called Whack-A-Mole. Um, it's a fairly short read. It's an easy read, and it's actually rather entertaining, uh, but it will very much uh, change your perspective of how you look at the world and our expectations regarding perfection and safety and, and error. Uh, it's available on Amazon like everything else uh, or at your local bookstore. Uh, so I do encourage you to read Whack-A-Mole. Uh, we would give them out to our, our leaders at our previous hospital. Um, so uh, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to share this with you. And I have some other colleagues who have some great information to share I've enjoyed working with. And I'll be available later to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. So incredibly grateful to you for sharing some of your um, your wisdom and experience. Um, and so grateful to have you uh, speaking a little bit more about some of this concept I put in the chat, but for those people who are joining us after on YouTube, imagine applying these principles, not only just to, to health care, but perhaps to child welfare, to every governmental department that is charged with protecting our lives. Imagine what that culture of transparency might look like, where we had government leaders that were owning, wow, this is a mistake, this is a problem, and let's work together to fix it. How many parts of our society are maintained by workarounds? And what could happen if we applied principles from aviation safety or from nuclear safety, and we applied them to the other um, areas that are also charged with the protection of human life? Um, so these principles are just so deep and meaningful and so very grateful to you, Dr. Goldberg, for sharing some of that. Um, I'm going to leave, uh, I know I just said something that's going to make for some interesting comments in the chat. Um, for those of you joining us on YouTube afterwards, um, this is why we love to have a continued conversation. But with that, I'm going to um, now introduce to you Dr. Leisha Hawker. Um, who is uh, the former president of Doctors Nova Scotia, um, who was not able to, unfortunately, she had a last minute um, conflict that came up. So last night, uh, she and I um, recorded this. So I'm going to press play and we're going to get to hear from her. I am so excited to introduce to everyone Dr. Leisha Hawker, former president of Doctors Nova Scotia and um, who works at the North End Community Clinic as well as many other places in our province. Dr. Hawker and I met as we were speaking as a part of a province-wide consultation on the importance of psychosocial determinants of health and the importance of interprofessional collaboration in primary health care. And I'm really excited to have Dr. Hawker talk a little bit about her understanding of safety and how it aligns with the work that she's doing. Dr. Hawker. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm quite excited uh, to, to talk about this topic. Um, and I'm really sad that I have a board meeting at the time that you guys are having this uh, conference because it sounds really fascinating. I'd love to watch the video later uh, to hear from all the other presenters. Uh, I, I am a family doctor and uh, I also do addiction medicine. Uh, I work at a couple places. I have too many jobs. Um, I, I work at the North End Community Health Center and I was really fortunate in like my first or second year of med school, I had an elective rotation through there. And I just, I, I felt like I found my home and my family. Um, the staff were quite diverse and I had come from all walks of life and different perspectives. And it was a really collaborative center unlike anything else I had experienced during my medical training so far. And then as a resident, I tried really hard to do a residency uh, rotation there. And I was very lucky to get a job right after residency at the North Lake Community Health Center. So I've been, been there for about 10 years. Um, and we've gone from maybe about 40 staff when I first started to over 100 now. 
So it's it's so much more than than a health clinic. It truly is a community health center. Um, it's the second oldest uh, community health center in Canada, or at least that's what the executive director tells me. <laughs> it's been around, I think, 52, 53 years at this point, so it's quite old. Uh, it actually started by community members sitting around a kitchen table, uh, deciding that when they were looking around, they had they had no healthcare in their neighborhood, and uh, and it was community members that started, it, and we're still very community focused. We're we are a nonprofit, and we're um, managed by a a board of directors with community represent representation on the board. And so when when it first began, we had essentially our own catchment area, so Roby Street down to the water, and I think it was I want to say Cornwallis to Duffus. Over time, with gentrification and you know these rent evictions and everything that we're seeing in the city, a lot of our patients are getting pushed out of that kind of traditional north end community. So now we service um, really across the HRM, uh, but we still have that community focus. Uh, many of our patients still live in kind of north central Halifax and walking distance from our from our health clinic. We have. Uh, so many healthcare providers. Um, I'm really lucky. And when I talk to other family doctors, they're all jealous um, <laughs> of the the expertise that I have just down the hall. So, so some of my favorite colleagues are my social worker friends, um, and uh, we have this really unique program called a walk-in clinic for social work, because as you guys know, a lot of our most vulnerable patients. They have really chaotic lives. You know, they can get to the clinic when they can get to the clinic and it's not, you know, they can't book four weeks in advance and and they just show up when they show up and sometimes they show up in crisis. Um, a lot of times they don't have phones that, you know, are they're out of minutes. So having a set time where they know they can just walk in and talk to a social worker has been really awesome. And then we've had that for a few years now. Um, and I think we've expanded our hours over the years as well. Some of the other folks that we have, uh, we have family practice nurses and and they have quite a broad scope compared to some of the family practice nurses that we have at that I've worked with at other clinics. Um, they do a lot of like our antipsychotic injections, um, well babies, prenatal education and care. Um, we do foot care clinics. Um, as you guys know, I don't have to tell you, um, but a lot of our vulnerable patients, uh, foot care is a, is a huge issue. Um, so our foot care nurse is probably like our, our, our busiest uh, healthcare provider at the, at the clinic. She's kind of hard to get into um, just because there's such a need for her. Um, we have a dietitian as well, and our dietitian actually in the past during, I think it was during COVID, did these awesome cooking classes, and we put it on Facebook, and a lot of the cooking classes were around, you know, how do you make like a really healthy, tasty meal out of, you know, cans of lentils and things like that, things that people can actually afford to buy, um, especially with the rising uh, grocery costs over the last couple of years, it's really important. We have we have a dental clinic uh, that's joint with Dalhousie. Um, Francine uh, is our dental hygienist. She's awesome. Um, I'm always sending people her way and she's always managing to fit them in. Uh, a lot of my patients who are on methadone, they have significant dental disease um, as a result of just kind of years of addiction and, and kind of not being able to Take care of their dental hygiene as best they could and then also the medication with all the sugar in it is not the best um, and it's a great spot for the dental hygiene students and the dental students to, to learn as well um, because we have such significant disease and uh, most of our patients otherwise wouldn't be able to access any dental care at all and so that's a really important part of our of our clinic we have multiple family doctors um, and we have shared care with uh, with psychiatry as well. So we have fifth year psychiatry residents. Uh, so we can, we're fairly lucky, uh, especially compared to most primary care clinics where we have reasonable access to, to mental health. And we have Esther, a lovely mental health nurse um, who does counseling as well. And then during, I think it was during COVID, we started a clinic called PAUSE, uh, which is psychologists. And it's essentially like, a walk-in, uh, although with COVID it's, it's switched to, to virtual, um, where you could get kind of urgent access to, to uh, psychological counseling. 
And I definitely don't want to forget to talk about MOSH. Um, MOSH stands for Mobile Outreach Street Health. Uh, it was started by a nurse colleague of mine, Patty Melanson, who is a former eMERGE nurse. And uh, you've probably seen the MOSH van um, kind of go around town. Uh, we have this really spiffy van now. It's uh, pretty much like a, a doctor's office in a in a van. I think it's a Mercedes actually. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what we started out was this old red minivan, and uh, it wasn't the best. Sometimes you'd have the the nurses would have to like put a seat down just to like be able to do a blood draw on a person or do their wound care management. But our MOSH is um, mostly nurse run, so we have fantastic nurses and nurse practitioners, uh, and they're able to access um, the doctor services too when, when needed. But the, the nurses go to, you know, encampment sites, shelters, uh, food banks, uh, places where there's warm meals, and it's really important. They have like a set schedule, so a lot of times our folks their lives are so challenging, but they always know like Jack, the nurse practitioner is going to be at Albert Lake Road, you know, on Fridays at this time. Um, and so they know where to find the MOSH van and uh, they can get the services they need. MOSH also has like some exam rooms in our community health center too. Uh, so a few of my colleagues uh, work out of that office and you can see some of our doctors through that too. During the pandemic, um, we we kind of seized the opportunity to um, start programs that we had been talking about for years. So we quickly developed an emergency managed alcohol program. That was uh, Dr. Leah Genge was the person that really kind of got that going. Um, and then we've done some safe supply. So we started uh, emergency safe supply as a harm reduction strategy. When when the shelters um, got COVID uh, and it was starting to really go through the shelter systems. Uh, we worked quite closely, MOSH did with public health to, to quickly get people into uh, hotels. Um, but there was no way that a lot of our folks were going to stay in, uh, in isolation for the duration that they were supposed to, because um, sometimes, you know, when you're in withdrawal, that um, priority trumps everything else. So, so we quickly uh, worked with public health to develop a, a managed alcohol and safe supply program um, and were able to keep people um, comfortable and, and, and not, you know, leaving isolation to, to seek the substances or, or other things that they needed. Um, we were able to uh, use our electronic medical record and, and develop like a template. Um, so we we tried to plan in advance knowing that we were going to want to evaluate this and 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 publish research results so we were able to chart in a very kind of consistent manner so that we could then mine the data um, and we were able to look at how it it actually was quite a quite a successful um operation during those waves of COVID, and and now we have uh, a regular safe supply program and a regular managed alcohol program one of the bigger things that the North Creedy Health Center has had for, I think it's about seven years now, is housing first. So we all know you can't have health without housing. And uh, housing first primarily started with trying to house um, the chronically homeless in Halifax. So those that have been homeless uh, for a very long time, many of them had very severe alcohol use disorder, um, you know, drinking non-beverage uh, alcohol as well and housing first we now have I, I wouldn't even know the number but multiple intensive case workers housing support workers peer workers we have multiple housing units um, i think the north and Creative health center has housed about a thousand folks over the last few years um, and it's just incredible um, what the team has done the team has grown so much now, if I go to a Christmas party, I don't know who half the staff are, <laughs> but it's it's so much more than more than a clinic and, and more than a community health center even. Um, and, and I'm just so proud uh, just to kind of be associated with the with the health center uh, and, and to be a small part of the team to, to do that work. Thank you so much. So why do you feel like um, 
the practice of medicine embedded in community changes the safety outcomes for your patients? Well, one of the things we look at is, was we try to really um, meet our patients where they're at, right? So sometimes if you go to a doctor, uh, I think everyone's experienced this before, you just don't feel heard or seen. Uh, and it's really hard to get the care that you need when that's the case. Um, and and sometimes uh, if if a healthcare provider takes a more like paternalistic approach, instead of really meeting you where you're at, uh, we try to take a, a quite a holistic and and harm reduction, trauma informed approach at the Northland Community Health Center, uh, and and I think that's that's vital, especially for the community that we serve. A lot of our patients have faced um, discrimination, discrimination and marginalization through multiple institutions, you know, whether it's foster care growing up and then the correctional system and the healthcare system. And so a lot of times it takes quite a bit of time to develop a level of trust. Um, and, and I think that's crucial uh, in terms of providing uh, appropriate medical care uh, that is that's safe um, and to, to, to be able to develop that relationship so that they, so that they come back. Um, because if you don't have that level of trust and that rapport, then then that patient's not going to come back to see you again. As a doctor, how do you feel like um, your ability to build trust or rapport is changed by working with other professions? Well, my social workers, I think, are, are probably the best at that. Um, sometimes I've been able to to witness how they do it and same with our nurses for mosh um i think it comes down to even just like the way like some like our, our mosh nurses act and dress they they kind of joke that you have to have blundstones to to work for mosh <laughs> so like nobody's wearing like lab coats or like you know like spiffy professional outfits uh they're they're walking in the woods and going to shelters and stuff so so everybody's dressed really casual we, we speak quite casually um and i and i think like we do anything we can so that we try to dismantle that that power imbalance that like you can't get rid of it completely but anything we can do to do that um this this is quite important too at the newcomer clinic which is the the clinic for refugees that i also work at so a lot of times my patients have been in a refugee camp for like 10 or more years um have seen and witnessed significant trauma many of them have lost multiple family members uh due to war and violence right in front of them and uh, many of them have injuries and uh physical injuries from from explosions or machete um attacks and things like that and so there's significant trauma at that clinic and you add in this culture barrier culture shock language barrier they, you know, they're just experiencing winter in Canada for the first time, trying to learn English, trying to get housing, you know, they're staying at the hotel or somewhere. And there's just, there's so many things on their mind uh, when they come to see you for the first time. So uh, it's, it's really important that we develop that level of trust and, and uh, anything I can do to make them feel, feel welcome and that they're safe in our office um we try to do so simple things like trying to learn you know some arabic phrases um now we have a lot of somali and dari speaking patients so my swahili and arabic was just starting to get good and now we have to try to learn a couple other uh you know just simple phrases like thanks for coming to see me like nice to meet you you know go in peace um uh, God willing, like inshallah, like if you know, hopefully your abdominal pain gets better soon. That kind of thing. I, I think it makes a big difference for the for the patients, uh, in feeling in feeling safe at that clinic. Last question: um, If you had a magic wand and you could fix all of healthcare <laughs> in Nova Scotia, what <laughs> would your, where would your thoughts start? I mean, we may not be able to fix it all immediately, but what would you like to see happen first to make everyone safer? Well, it's funny because you hear all about collaborative care now and it's like a buzzword and it's like, you know, the future of healthcare. 
but the North End Community Health Center has been doing it for over 50 years. It's really not a novel idea. And, and sure, you might not need um, all the professions that, that we have. Like if you're setting up a collaborative health center in like Digby or something, like you're probably not going to need as many peer support workers or housing first workers. Um, but maybe because there's more seniors, you might be needing more diabetic education or occupational therapists to make sure people are staying safe in their homes and, you know, they're not at risk of falls and, and, and other support. So I think you need to take the model of a community health center and uh, a patient's medical home or, or a patient's health neighborhood and community and, and expand that and look at each unique community and see what complement of healthcare providers are needed in that community to, to keep people healthy and safe. Thank you so much for sharing some of your vision and some of your understanding of how to make uh, the practice of medicine safer here in Nova Scotia. So grateful for everything you do and for sharing some of your time and wisdom with us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So with that, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to hear from different disciplines and um, to have an opportunity to learn from. Uh, I'm going to now invite Mark who um, transformed my thinking about um, everything um, in particular, uh, because Mark is a, an engineer and I had no idea how much my brain is actually wired like an engineer until I met Mark. Um, Mark is uh, another brilliant teacher um, and uh, he and I worked together on redesigning patient flow in um, several hospitals where I was, um, able to work. Mark, can you turn your camera on? I can't. Um... Uh, yeah, I think I can try to do that. Um, okay. Awesome. Let's see, choose. I beg your pardon and see, how do I oh, do that? You are I... good. Oh, I'm. It's, uh, it's right there. There it is. There. Okay. Hey. So this is Mark and Mark is a brilliant um, teacher and uh, healthcare coach and engineer. And Mark's going to share um, his screen. It's a little better. You are great. And we're excited to learn from you and learn how we talked about um, what if we treated all of our systems that are charged with our health and safety um, with the same kind of principles that uh, are used for like aerodynamic safety or um, air travel or nuclear safety. And so that means learning from many disciplines, including those that are maybe um, less understood by um, some of us. So with that, I'm going to welcome Mark to share some of his thoughts okay. on safety and healthcare, safety okay. and everything. Very good. So how do I, uh, can I share my screen? Yes. You so see. you should see a little green button that says yep. share screen. Perfect. There it is. Yeah. And then you can click on the little. Can you all see it? Uh, probably. Yes, we can yeah. see it. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Let me turn on the. There we are. So, you, so if you go to slide sh slideshow, you should be able to um, to. Sh are you are you seeing it just right now, or do I need to do something else? We see it. Oh, we great. See, we see it. Great. So, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Naj, for the introduction. I hope I can live up to the the hype there. Uh, but I want to talk about engineering engineering safety and quality into healthcare. And in my background, that's a side-by-side -side refrigerator. And I was just going to ask the group here, would you buy a refrigerator that was unreliable, of poor quality, unsafe, or even a high cost of ownership? And the answer, of course, you wouldn't. So uh, a lot of the experience that I had at GE, I'll share some of that with you uh, as briefly as I can with just a, a few minutes to share. But uh, I'm the co-founder of Practical Healthcare. And as well, I'm a partner with the Six Sigma Management Institute. Uh, and a certified Lean Six Sigma instructor. And I want to share some of those tools that I've accumulated over the years with and how it might apply to incorporating and building in safety and quality into healthcare. So a little bit about my background. Uh, like the first third of my, two thirds of my career uh, is in manufacturing where I was more of a practitioner of workout and GE as uh, tools, Lean Six Sigma in all areas. I was there for a long time. So I got to do, do it all and see it all. Uh, I then decided to take those skills and take them outside and was more of a consultant role. And I worked a lot on company turnarounds, 
waste elimination, uh, improving the cycle time and so forth in a whole variety of, of industries from manufacturing to transportation. And then I took a bold step by uh, moving over to healthcare, thinking confident in myself that I, this would just be an instant win and people would just gravitate toward it. Uh, I think I was a little uh, mistaken about that and I'll share a little bit why, but I was more of an evangelist uh, working on quality systems with Lean Six Sigma. Uh, and more recently, uh, Norton has moved from the Joint Commission to DNVGO, which is an ISO company uh, based. And so uh, I, I, my current role is all about creating lean uh, systems around ISO. So that's been another uh, uh, development in my career. But more importantly, um, working with Dr. Nays, and he'll share, you more, share with you more about the details, is I feel like I've become more of an innovator and integrator. All this cumulative knowledge has now come to a very great point where uh, we take through patients through self-discovery, through patient archetypes, actually applying Six Sigma tools that I'll share with you, and also integrating that with social media solutions. And I've trained hundreds of, of folks over the years in these techniques, and, uh, and it gives me a great chance to learn about other, other opportunities. So when I see this word here, uh, this is, was the, my first exposure of the language difficulty. In engineering school, that means standard, but apparently in healthcare, it means something completely different. And so I, that was my first exposure of, of learning that we have differences. So this might be how doctors view engineers. This is, I love far side. It says, oh, look at that, Dr. Schuster. Engineers are so cute when they try to comprehend medical procedures. So Dr. Um, sorry, Mark, um, I think you might be looking at uh, a different slide than we are. We still are on your front slide. Oh, so, I'm um, sorry. I think. Now yeah. let's try again. Do you see, do you see the cartoon? We do not see the cartoon. Man. I don't know if um, you would Let like me again. to share your, share my, share your PowerPoint. Uh, let me try it one more time. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you for no, stopping you're good. me. You are good. Here we are talking about, now can you, let me try it again. Can you see it now? No, we can't see anything. So I think but, what's happened is you might've shared the wrong screen. So okay. maybe if you unshare right. and then try sharing again, the yeah. screen that you, um, yes. Oh, uh, there it is. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. There okay, we go. Let's enjoy your cartoon now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so you know, I think that engineers might view doctors a slightly different way. I love this cartoon. Whoa, look at that one. That's a good one. Just poke his brain right where my finger is. So you know, there is some things we can teach each other. Um, and uh, I had the opportunity a few years back when COVID was just starting, and, and the hospitals were uh, missing and, and and had a short supply of ventilators. So I reached out to GE. Engineers said, hey, can we take a modify a, a fitting to convert our breathing devices in, into ventilators? And so it's, it's always good to keep your friends close. You never know when you're going to have to ask for a favor. And the other thing I'd like to share with you is I, I do believe that quality can be built in, not inspected in. And that was really a, a radical change for me when I, I moved into healthcare. I assumed that that was already built in, but I, I'm finding out that there's a lot of gaps, a lot of gaps in that. So what is quality and what causes that quality to, to, to separate? Well, you've got a supplier and a customer, provider and patient, and that whenever there's a need that's met and someone who can provide it, there's a good intersection, kind of a Venn diagram. Uh, but occasionally though, those can be uh, fall apart. We're not meeting expectations and we're missing operational targets. And sometimes the customer moves away from the old process. Uh, there's a lot of DIY out there, uh, and there's also changes in delivery options. So quality tools help restore that, that, that relationship. So how do we do that? Well, one of the techniques that I've used over the years is, is an acronym called DMAIC, and it's, it's the Lean Six Sigma process. And it seems very straightforward, and there's a lot of statistics in it, but there's also some soft skills, which I'll share with you. Uh, first thing you wanna do is define the problem. It's amazing how often we don't even start there. We just sort of start with the solution. Then you want to measure the current state and not try to reinvent something until you fully understand it. And then you want to analyze. You want to understand some of the root causes. And then you want to brainstorm solutions and work toward the best solutions to, to test out first. And then once you've got that working, then you want to control it so that you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel over and over again. So it's a pretty radical process that I was exposed to early in my career. 
And the, the goal of Six Sigma, actually the, the metric is three 3.4 defects per million opportunities. Wouldn't it be great if our healthcare system was that good? And it can be with, with some, some, uh, some work. Um, one of the things that I encountered over the years was resistant to change. Uh, we'd had great solutions, but uh, I, we came up with this ear model because it has to be effective, it has to work, it has to make sense, it has to be evidence-based, safe and effective, and, and you've taken the voice of all the stakeholders. But more importantly, it has to be accepted. There has to be buy-in. The team has to understand why we're doing it. Leader has to support it. And it has to be aligned with your visions and values. And then most importantly, you want to make this, whatever solution you come up with, whether it's a system or, a, or an, on an individual patient basis, easy to do the right thing. So you want to have structured solutions as you're working through the methodology. But more importantly, you want to be able to lock in and sustain the gains. So why is change so difficult? Well, I want you to meet Sarah. This is my daughter when she was younger. Actually, it isn't. It looks like her when she was frowning at me. But whenever we're encountering change, we often meet at it with look at it with surprise. Then we move to anger and then rejection, acceptance. And then finally, we come around and, and ask for help. I bring this up because this is an important thing to realize that we all go through this. And as a caregiver or as a system redesign person, you need to be aware that you're taking your team or your individual patients through this through this process. Um, another thing to think about in the soft skills area is that not all patients and not all people in your team are the same. You have people of, of varying degrees of will and skill. And Dr. Nees is gonna talk a little bit about how we took this model and applied it to practical healthcare. But when you have someone just coming into an organization, they typically have low will, low skill, and they were what we would call resistors. Um, you might have people on your staff who are very skilled, but aren't on board at all with what you're doing. We call them blockers. And we have willing followers occasionally, people that are gung-ho, can't wait to start, but they don't really have the skills that they need. Uh, what we'd like to do is develop advocates, people that have both high skill and high will. All right, so one of the questions I was asked uh, by Naj was, can we do a safety huddle in 15 minutes? Upper right corner, you can see that I've got the my favorite thing, my, my sticky notes. People think I have stock in 3M. I don't, but they're an effective tool for getting everyone to, to participate. So the first thing you want to do is start with celebrations, shout outs, milestones, start positive, uh, and then move over to the good catch, safe moments, near misses that might have occurred. And again, I've coached people how to use the sticky notes. Uh, my wife's a nurse, so she would write an entire sticky note in, with very great detail. And I tell people, just put seven words or less on one card if you can. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity to move over to the policy reminders. Hey, uh, there was an email sent out. Did everyone understand it or went on board with it? Then you want to talk about the patient handoff, any high-risk patient concerns, um, safety action items. These would be, would be things that were discovered that we want to follow up on and maybe even apply the DMAIC process to, to resolve it uh, once and for all. And lastly, um, you want to give people the opportunity to, to express their ideas in a way that's quick, but we don't have the time to just dwell on it right now. So what we, we have a, what's called a parking lot, a flip chart that says parking lot on it. And it's a chance for you to put anything that wasn't covered in the traditional thing. And these would be things that we would want to follow up with. Now, when I was looking at the, um, the various huddles uh, at CHI, there was one um, meeting that was an hour long. And I think they, they, they finally just said, we're done. And then I went to another hospital and I saw something quite different. It was a 15 minute huddle and it was following this same methodology here. And the woman there was, she was from Great Britain and she had acute quaint um, English brogue. And when people started to get off target, she would remind them of the flow. She would point to the board and say, we're going to stay on target, dearie. And so I would ask you to uh, channel your, your Mrs. Doubtfire, you know, be firm, but fast and make it fun. All right. So how can we incorporate this demaic and everyday interactions? Let's talk about the, the measure phase. That's where you start to communicate what, you know, what the situation, the defined phase rather. And you want to move to capture and clarify, and you're, you're in the define phase. Um, you can see the picture on the right there. Using those post-it notes to capture or even sharing data is where you are in the me measure phase. And then as you move to analyze, it's important to make sure that everyone everyone's on board. And a technique that I've used for consensus building, if, if you're not familiar with this, let me share this with you. We use this technique called fist to five. Fist means I'm not in the boat. Five means I'm in the boat paddling. And to demonstrate, I would say, let's say we're going to have pepperoni pizza 
for lunch and fist to five, everyone could, puts their fingers up or hands up. And there might be one person who's a fist and I'm not in the boat. And I would say, how, what would it take to get you in the boat? And that person would say, well, I'm a vegan or vegetarian. And I would say, well, well let's, let's offer that as an option. Now, what do we want to do now? Hopefully you get that person on board and fist to five is a great tool. Even at a personal level, my kids make fun of me because I've done fist to five when we're deciding where we want to go out to eat and they roll their eyes, but I still, and I want to see, are you a two, a five or a zero? So use that technique to get people on board with you. Closing the meeting is you're in the improved phase. And again, if you want to keep this on target, dark, excuse me, you want to challenge a team to, to be brief, to, you know, make sure you capture the items quickly and then move on because we're going to come back, right? We're going to come back and, and revisit if we need to. And that's the control phase. So you can use this methodology even in your everyday um, huddles. So let's talk about building in safety through risk elimination. And uh, Dr. Goldberg uh, talked about it a little bit. Um, this is something that I discovered. I really like this approach. So let's say you're a diner and you want to stay in business. And the, at the very base level, we call that the PPE level. You recall that we did masks, right? Uh, social distancing was next. And you remember those placards on the on the floor, you know, social distance six feet. Moving up the the uh, effectiveness uh, pyramid, there would be engineering controls. We would put things like hand sanitizers everywhere in restaurants, right? Uh, but, but maybe the, the uh, business would decide to substitute. Hey, we're going to switch our model from uh, dine-in to carry-out only. So that's substitution. And then ultimately what you want to do is move toward eliminating the risk altogether. And that's really what we want to challenge ourselves to do is, is building in the safety. Uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll share that risk prioritization number I talked about uh, earlier today, if, if Naj will give me a little bit more time if I don't speak too long. So you, you want to push your team to, to work toward building it in so that it's, it's you don't have to inspect it in. So can Lean Six Sigma, how can it help my practice? So I wanna share with you very quickly uh, a Greenbelt project that I coached uh, and it was in the stroke area at Norton Healthcare. And the first thing you do, and you can see in the upper right corner there, there's a little highlighted D, we were in the define phase. And I coached her, I said, you just don't give us too much detail right now, just what's the problem? And the problem was patient transfers from the ED to the stroke hospitals just took too long. And so a little bit of background, the target was 90 minutes. And what we found out is 90% of the patients transferred were transferred exceeding that number. So we were well beyond this, the target. So we decided to use a green belt project to improve patient safety by reducing door in and door out time. Uh, the first thing you wanna do is gather voice and you're still in the defined phase. You're wanting, so we brainstorm with the sticky notes. What are, what's, What's the must haves for this project? And then we we put them in logical subgroups. And so the first thing was a lot of things about timely treatment, obviously, you can see the other items beneath that. We wanted to have effective EMS communication, and we also wanted to have effective nursing communication. So that became kind of the things that we were going to measure our solution against. So if we were successful in, in meeting this, the voice of the customer or voice of the business, then we've got a great solution. The way we do that is we involve everyone that touches the process in the process. So this is the data. We're now in the measure phase and uh, lots of wincing when we share this, but look at this graph. I mean, it's just awful. And this is after the patient was given TPA. So the goal signal was they should have already been gone, uh, but because of some uh, issues we encountered, uh, we, we were not meeting the target at all. Uh, sometimes the best way to, to understand the process is just to do what we call process mapping. So we just say, okay, what's the first step? What's the second step? And so on. You, it's kind of hard to read that graphic, but I did it this way because if you're doing process mapping, don't spend a lot of time making a pretty graph. Just, just use this. This is what you use for discovery. And so what we did is we, we laid all the process steps and then we asked the team, okay, what are the two most important steps? Well, first of all, you got to make the two calls, one to the receiving uh, hospital and to the EMS. And so we highlighted th those steps in green. And then we went back and said, let's talk about steps that are not value added, that really are like wasted steps. And it turns out that almost half the time was spent on what we call non-value added by refoning the same facility over and over again, calling the doc, calling the nurse. So those were opportunities for improvement that we wanted to focus our process improvement around. 
And the way we did that is we started to say, well, okay, we, we know we have this uh, bad process. Let's brainstorm barriers. And so we, that's what you see on the sticky notes. And then another technique that uh, we use called multi-vote. I gave everyone on the team five votes. I said, put a tick mark on the, the sticker that you or the car that you think is the most important to work on. And then we put little green stickies on our green uh, uh, dots to say, those are what we're going to focus our solutions around. And so what we found out is communication received the most uh, uh, votes for a, as a barrier. And that's what we wanted to focus our attention on. Another technique that uh, we use is called root cause. So, um, uh, and it's five Y. So it highlighted in red, we said, well, we have a delay when we call the EMS. Well, why was that? Because well, we don't have a bed. Well, why was that? Because we don't have a bed assignment. Well, why was that? Because the supervisor must contact, contact the ICU nurse. Well, why is that? Because they must take report. And so we found that that was the most critical delay that we wanted to focus our efforts around. And then taking the five whys of the five hows, then you can see what we're going to do to make sure we improve that. And these are some of the solutions that we, that we uh, incorporated into the, the, the solution set. The nice thing about me being a data guy is I said, well, let's, let's get a, a time stamp of all the things that happen with all the touch points on average. And then we said, we wanted to make this a real lean process. What are the things that we could eliminate? Just the plain wastes of time. And as you can see there, we have reduced the, the, the non-value added or wasted time by 63%, which is pretty amazing for a first cut at this. And one of the ways that we did this, now we're moving into the improve phase, and we had a multitude of forms. Everyone had their own version of the truth. And we said, can we just at least have one sheet of music to, to read from? And it took a while to get all the hospitals on board to, to agree to that format. But that seemed to be the real uh, key point for making seamless transfers for the patients. And the other thing that we did is we made sure that we had a go signal that was one signal. So when the TPA was given, um, supervisor was, was contacted and EMS was contacted as well at the same time. Um, another important part about the DMAIC process is to make sure that you do have a communication plan. So you say, well, what are we gonna, who's going to be told and how? Is this going to be an email? Uh, we also incorporate the safety huddle process to make sure that all the, the units heard that, about the new process. So we, we really wanted to formalize the communication plan uh, this way, as you can see there. And then the control plan. So once this was uh, in place, how are we going to know we're, we're, we didn't you know, fall back. So the uh, uh, the team consulted the risk department and they agreed that they would review these on a monthly basis to make sure that we're staying on target. And if not, we would issue uh, corrections as to why. This is the, the results after in the control phase uh, on 123 minutes on average down to just under 30 minutes. And this is right away. Um, I reached out to uh, uh, Sasha Lopez now, and, and uh, she's left Norton and in a different area, but she said, hey, I still use what you taught me. And we did this also at uh, an Oklahoma facility, the same process, and reduced their uh, turnaround time by 50%. And this is the greatest thing about this process, if you can replicate it. So if you already got a solution that works, you want to be able to uh, try to replicate it. So you have to reinvent the, the wheel there. So here's some organizational benefits of Six Sigma. Uh, it helps you redesign processes to improve patient care. It helps you engage the staff to become problem solvers. Uh, it focuses on built-in quality and safety. And ultimately you wanna change the culture and strengthen your practice. So I'll leave you this, with this last idea. So what if I applied these tools to my personal health? How, what would that look like? And it is kind of a segue to what Dr. Nays is going to present about practical health care. But thinking about practical health care, applying these tools. So in the defined phase, I had my annual physical and defined the problem as I was obese. Uh, and my doctor would always say the same thing. Mark, you've got to lose weight to get healthy. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me look at the, the blood work. And he showed it, showed it to me. He says, well, it's abnormal. You've got a few markers that uh, that are out of whack. Uh, and usually what I did is I dismissed it. I said, well, I feel good. And 80% of my numbers look good, but the 20% didn't look bad. Uh, you know, so what? Uh, but I had a real change of attitude. 
uh, and looking at some of the causes. And what I found out that I went back in the history and my blood gl glucose and triglycerides were never normal. They were always out of whack but, and I was focusing on the wrong, the wrong metric there. So then I started looking at social media and looking at some of these uh, docs that talk about how to, to get that in, under control and started experiment. I, I thought, well, what if keto, would that work for me? And using the ear model, it looked like it was an effective solution for me, certainly something I could do very easily. So I accepted it. And it did have a certain amount of rigor, which is cutting out the carbs. So then I went back, I called my doctor and said, you know, I feel pretty good here. Uh, my weight's down, but I want you to, to redo my blood because I think there's sort of success there. And uh, yeah, sure enough, my, no, my blood work was normal for the first time. I went back six years. I was always on the edge. So my blood glucose and my triglycerides were in the normal range for the first time in a long time. And I lost some weight, uh, which is kind of a byproduct. So really what I'm trying to say is this paradigm shift is, is to, was to get healthy first and the weight would follow. So I hope that helps you understand how this, this methodology can be used at a system level, um, organizational level, and certainly at a personal level. And with that, I thank you for this opportunity. Um, there's my email address if you want to uh, do any follow-up and I'll take some questions. Do we take them now, Naj, or, or afterwards? We'll do that after, just to make Perfect. sure that we get Dr. Nazar. Thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you. I apologize for the no, uh, technical glitch there. We are grateful to have you. Thank you so much for um, sharing some of your knowledge and wisdom with us. And I know it went really fast and, and it probably there were a lot of translation issues because of the difference between American healthcare and Canadian healthcare and engineering yeah. and social work and medicine. Um, but we can see that methodology is a method of being able to analyze the entire process. And when you were talking about the stickies and you had that, that list of like current process and future process, one of the things that touched me the most when we work together is when we were looking at the redesign of patient care and you didn't get a chance to see all of the chat, but there were comments because most safety huddles that some people see don't involve every single person from whether you are sweeping the floor, whether you are the president, whether you're a doctor, nurse, social worker, whether you're someone transporting and patient transport, every single person has a perspective. But what was really important when we worked together was we had patients and family members who were part of every step of the redesign, mm -hmm. what is the current process? And then we, we, we looked at like multiple redesigns where everyone was able to redesign the process and have the patient be part of that. Oh, you don't know that when you go through the steps, this is what's causing me to feel scared and unsafe. And what are the steps involved in redesign so that we get everyone's voice in it and everyone is kind of redesigning together and we're measuring in ways that improve safety. Imagine doing that in other mm -hmm. disciplines and other approaches. So thank you so much for sharing sure. some of your wisdom from an engineering perspective. And you're very welcome. That, um, this is Dr. Nazar. So welcome Dr. Nazar and uh, we're excited to learn from you. Hello. Well, thank you, Naj, and thank you to the fellow panelists who gave wonderful presentations. So I'm tasked with kind of combining all these concepts and ideas, and I'm going to take the unique approach of rather than applying them top down from a system um, giving solutions, treatments, resources to the patients, but from a bottom up perspective where the patients are pulling these resources when they need them. And so this is the concept or ethos of practical healthcare. When I'm asked what it is, patients are, everyone learns how to drive a car, ride a bike, but we never learn how to be a patient. So this is a methodology using Lean Six Sigma tools um, that Mark referenced for patient-driven care and with that patient-driven safety. And we do that by empowering self-advocacy. So a little bit about me, uh, I am a Torontonian, so it's wonderful to be talking to some fellow Canadians. I got my Tim Hortons mug right here. And um, I also have type one diabetes. So not only am I a physician, but I'm also a chronic disease patient. And I'm so surprised with my knowledge of how the system works and how difficult it is to be an effective patient. 
my past medical history in terms of my background is I'm neurosurgery trained, did my neurosurgery internship at University of Toronto, have done outcomes research for the past 16 years on how integrating patient stories and lived experiences into care plans improves outcomes. I left neurosurgery practice to become a health tech and hospital executive where I achieved a master's in healthcare administration to empower that move. There was my first introduction to Lean Six Sigma. From there, I uh, went back to work at Norton Healthcare and met Mark and has since become a disciple of his Lean Six Sigma concepts and achieved my black belt from him. After COVID, I suffered from burnout and thought I could make a bigger impact um, by empowering patients to care for themselves. And so I settled into a workers' comp practice, a medical legal practice. I got my board certification in disability medicine and am a certified independent medical examiner. So basically, I'm the line in the legal system where I have to write that a patient who suffered a work injury um, has no chance of improvement or deterioration for the next year. And that kind of ends their workers' comp um, uh, relationship. Um, with that, I had a constraint. I couldn't treat these patients. The majority of them hadn't returned back to work. They still had an impairment that was affecting their day-to-day -day activities. With my um, empathy as a patient who knows how difficult it is and my constraint of not being able to treat them, I had to have a method to offer them for them to continue to get better. And that's where practical healthcare uh, breathed its first breath was developing a method with our patients that empowered them to take control and confidence in their healthcare decisions. So the current state, as Mark referenced, is where we start. We always need to measure where we're at. The P represents a patient. Patients are overwhelmed. Maybe they can't get access to healthcare. There's a transportation issue. They can't get a babysitter. They can't take off work. If they take off work, are they going to lose money? Can they afford the prescription? Well, is the care good enough? Do they get along with the doctor? Were they prescribed the right medication? Um, was the right problem treated? Was there a misdiagnosis? Well, there's a knowledge gap that exists. There's also, does the patient have community support, family support, or caregivers at home to assist in the process? How's the patient's mental health? What's their lifestyle? Do they smoke? Do they have good sleep? And lastly, do they have a safe place to go home to? Do they have food insecurity, et cetera, et cetera? With all that being said, that's very overwhelming for both the system and the patient themselves. But we've forgotten something here. Not all of these things are equal. The only way that we can find out which one matters the most is by asking the patient. This is where voice of customer comes in. So voice of customer is a way to get initial data. We can start by asking an open-ended question, which I did for 750 patients. Why are you dissatisfied with healthcare? Here's an example of an answer. I've been to four different doctors who each told me to do different things. I'm on multiple medications and feel groggy, have physical therapy twice a week, counseling once a week, and caring for my sick mother at home. This is an 18-year-old post-car crash with anxiety and back pain. Another example is a, a truck driver uh, who had bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome saying he feels trapped by his injury. He can't work. He's lost his independence. And all the doctors say there's nothing more they can do. From a system perspective, these patients got appropriate care. They saw the relevant physicians, they completed their PT, but they were left in a state that wasn't meaningful, that wasn't impactful. But from a medical metric standpoint, there's no problem with these cases. So we have to dig deeper than this. We have to do a root cause analysis. We have to not only diverge, but reconverge. And that's what root cause analysis allows us to do. So here we are in this finding the problem, the right problem for that patient, not assuming the problem. So we do a deep dive. As Mark referenced, we use a technique called five whys. So for those 750 patients, we ask why. It doesn't have to be five times, but enough until there's no other answer. And we ended up with 3,528 different responses. So here's an example of that process. I'm dissatisfied with my healthcare. Well, why? Because I'm overwhelmed. Well, why are you overwhelmed? I've been to four doctors. I've been told to do different things. 
I can't do any more. I don't feel heard because healthcare is about adding more, more, more. Do this, go there, see them. We rarely take things away. Six Sigma is about eliminating waste and identifying the vital things someone can do to move the process forward. For this patient, their root cause of all this chain is that his mother came first, and we never incorporated that into a care plan. So let's keep going. Um, all those responses were too much for me to interpret. Mark mentioned a process called affinitization. Um, so we use AI, which is a word cloud um, uh, with this word cloud. And we had AI look at different terms and themes and groupings and progressively cluster these down into four themes. So we're able to go from a vast amount of answers of various unique problems to kind of four general groupings. You can see here how some of those words associate already. Impersonal, impractical, one size fits all, unheard, alone. Um, these themes are very important to understand as the root causes. And these are the four major ones we identify. They kind of exist in a hierarchy, believe it or not. If you have external constraints and limitations, how could you complain that healthcare is impersonal? You're not accessing it. You have these constraints. So the first barrier that patients face is external constraints and limitations. The second is a loss of control, independence, or autonomy due to the medical problem. The third is now that they have the problem identified and trying to navigate it, the overwhelming complexity and confusion. And lastly, when they are navigating it and they get an evidence-based treatment, there may be a lack of impersonal or practical solutions incorporated in that treatment plan. So let's now map these problems to kind of patient personas or archetypes, if you will. There's an avoider personality, someone who has external constraints and limitations. My mother comes first. So I'm going to avoid what's going on here. Maybe I can't afford healthcare. Maybe I don't have insurance. I can't take time off work or I have a special needs child at home. These are all the external constraints that result in you avoiding owning your own care in a preventative patient driven way. There's the talker where you have lost independence, control and autonomy. I don't feel heard. I'm saying, hey, this matters to me, but you're not listening. They're talking but they're stuck. Then there's the planner. Overwhelming complexity, communication, I'm overwhelmed. Analysis paralysis. Believe it or not, when we do a job filter for the types, the archetypes, nurses and doctors fit in this um, area a lot. That's because they know what to do, but they don't know how to personally select the vital thing to do. There's no filter, so they do it all and they burn out. Lastly, the advocate, impersonal experience, lack of human connection, they're tired of the one-size-fits-all approach. They want something personal. So we wanted to be able to predict this in a more effective way than a huge word cloud analysis. So we developed a health personality assessment or a quiz. We can predict when someone's an avoider, uh, when someone's a talker, when someone's a planner, when someone's an advocate. And we do this using two dimensions, motivation and means. So an avoider has low motivation, low means. They can't do it, they won't do it. There's other things important. When I get sick, the doctor's in charge. This also mirrors the patient activation measure. The talker, they have high motivation because they've lost their, their autonomy. They wanna get better, but they have constraints on how that needs to happen. So they don't have the means. The system doesn't empower them to do so. The planner has high means, they have access, they have knowledge. Um, but they're stuck. They lack that confidence or motivation to find the effective treatment. And lastly, we have the advocate, where they are their own health advocate, they can and will do. So with each of these um, archetypes, we've um, validated predictive analytics. Avoiders have very high use of ED, ER, very high risk of readmission, very high costs. Advocates, on the other hand, has very low uh, readmission risk, ER use, and very good use of preventative care. In our 750 patients, 40% of those were categorized as avoiders, 15% as advocates. So we see that the system has a hidden curriculum that disenfranchises patient stories, where patients only receive care at their biggest times of need, 
And at that point, they have to figure out how health integrates with their sense of self. And we don't have a method to do that. We try. It's hit or miss. It's one off. A lot of you on this call, especially as social workers, are probably very effective at doing that. But we want to put a method behind it to move an avoider to an advocate. So what's the future state look like? Right now, we have avoiders who have trivial many problems, trivial many solutions, and they're kind of stuck. They're a baton being passed through this healthcare system. Whereas an advocate has identified the vital few things that need to be done, the vital few problems that need to be addressed. They're the driver of their healthcare experience. This is what we want to create. So again, just a quick summary, four types of archetypes, avoiders, talkers, planners, and advocates, each with a hierarchy of a problem, external constraints, loss of control, loss of confidence, and impractical or impersonal care plans. Remember, 50% of patients do not comply with evidence-based treatment plans. This is part of the reason for the advocates. They've gotten to the point where they're receiving treatment, but they don't stick with it. Mark mentioned the ear model, that a solution doesn't just have to be effective. It needs to be effective, accepted, and have some rigor or metric behind it. So for avoiders, we need them to accept that these external constraints exist. For talkers, we need to put some meaningful rigor to help them measure their loss of control and see the stepwise improvements. For planners, we need to give them some confidence around, hey, there are effective treatments out here and you don't need to do it all. And for advocates, we need them to own this, this process, kind of a train the trainer model where they help others now. So we can move patients through this cascade, this different archetype structure, and we do that with a Lean Six Sigma-based approach, where instead of DMAIC, our defined stage is called awareness. Our measure analyze phase uh, and improve is connection discovery, and the control phase is storytelling. We use Lean Six Sigma tools in each of these phases. So awareness uses voice of patient, connection uses measurement and affinitization, discovery, brainstorming, force diagram, storytelling, control plan, and crowdsourcing. I'm going to go into a few of these and then wrap up for you. So again, we have this avoider who's overwhelmed. And as we get their voice of patient, who they are as a human, nope, we start with the health personality. When an avoider's told they're an avoider, they're not offended. They're actually like, of course I am. It's almost a burden's been lifted off of them. And they realize that other people who are avoiders exist. There's a community there. They don't feel alone anymore. So then we ask about their values and we see how the um, trivial many are starting to drop off because the patient's developing a filter for making meaningful healthcare decisions. Do they value friends, family, faith? Do they value their job, return to work, their sports career? What is their driving need? What are their pursuits and hobbies? That young patient that I mentioned above um, with anxiety who couldn't return to work um, the way that he overcame his fear of car crashes was playing video games and getting a driving simulator. Let's align their therapy, their care plans with what they enjoy. Fears and preferences. If someone avoids surgery, we really need to go into that before saying, hey, you need surgery. If someone's fearful of it. Um, lastly, constraints. These are your psychosocial uh, determinants of health. Uh, and then the practical problem. And this structure, this voice of customer helps create a talker because now they're an expert at this part of the care. We can make assumptions on all of these things, but unless we get it from the patient, then we're making big assumptions. Our method is empowering the patient, tasking the patient to own that part so we don't have to be constantly trying to balance time management, asking these questions, doing surveys, intakes. Let's get the patients to bring this to the table. Let's teach them how. And this is important because 50% of outcomes, nearly 50% are determined by everyday factors. Those are the things the patient's an expert in. So again, practical problem was that big jump to becoming a talker. On the left side, we see disease and disorder, impairment, disability, handicap, spectrum uh, that I deal with as a disability medicine physician. Disease as evidence level, imaging labs as a spine surgeon. If I saw a disc, I'm going to operate on it. 
it's kind of a hammer approach for that one size fits all. In Paramount, a lot of rehab deals at this level, um, medical doctors as well, but there's a functional loss at an organ level. There's a dividing line here where on the left side, this is kind of the medical system. On the right side, we talk about the person level and the society level. How does that disease or disorder impact their everyday life and how they function in society? We don't really handle this that well in healthcare. We're getting better. We're talking about it. I know your jobs deal a lot on this side of things. But again, there's not enough social workers. There's never enough resources. So let's have the patients own it. And so on the left, doctors are the experts. On the right, patients are the experts. How this looks on an actual EMR, or your day-to-day. -day. So there's a medical problem, your health plan, where the providers are experts. We have services and treatments. So let's take an example, patient with an L5 sciatica. We say, okay, you can take muscle relaxants. You can take um, SSRIs, go to physical therapy, six months, come back for an injection. If that doesn't work, you're going to back surgery. That could create an avoider pretty easily. Well, what if we ask this same patient what their practical problem was? They can't sit. Okay. What are your values? Your family, your health, your independence. What are your preferences, pursuits, and hobbies? Patient preferred the least invasive treatment. He'd already had a spine surgery had a good experience with it, but know how difficult it was to go through. And he's 69 years old now. He has a family vacation coming up in three months that he wants to go to. And he's also an active runner. What about his constraints and fears? Again, he was afraid of surgery, missing vacation, and had time limitations. This patient's become a talker now. He can talk about how can't sitting affects his life. So the power of language empowers. That's been a theme throughout all the talks today. With this knowledge, we can create gains in his treatment plan. Let's get you to go on family vacation. Let's free up some time. Let's avoid surgery. Well, gosh, we have some filters now to make decisions. Let's relieve some of these pains too. This patient obviously values independence and health. Some do-it-yourself solutions would be appropriate. They value their family, so let's incorporate them and their running group and friends. Maybe home PT is better than going into the office because of the time restrictions. We see how now we're customizing and personalizing the plan. This is the power of and. Now we need to kind of take these talkers and turn them into planners. We do that through measurement and affinitization. We come up with a practical goal. This patient said, I want to be pain-free before our method. After the measurement phase, he says, I want to be able to sit for two hours with tolerable pain levels by February for a family vacation. Again, this is prompt-driven questioning that's self-guided. No health coaching, all driven from the patient with prompt-wise questions. We support them further through affinitization, not of their concepts, by matching them and grouping them with other patients with the same lived experiences and practical problems. Um, this group, then we ask sample prompts to so they can brainstorm together and they develop that sense of community and practice talking. Do your health choices reflect your values? Patients will tell you what doesn't work and where it hurts. So we ask, what is the one thing you can stop doing right now that would make your problem better? Saying no is such an important part of healthcare from the patient perspective. We have to empower that ability. So we have this overwhelmed patient with a lot of options and we're gonna to try to apply a tool for them now to find the right solution. So that back pain patient, I can do home PT exercises. There's 10 of them. I can go to physical therapy if I want, if I have time. I can take a muscle relax and NSAID, SSRI. Gosh, there's everything, heat, ice, et cetera, et cetera. We employ a force diagram for that patient to make better decisions and identify the vital thing that they need to do to achieve their goal. The way this looks like in practice is aggravating factors on one side, alleviating factors on the other. So aggravating for this patient, prolonged sitting was his number one. It was a 10 out of 10. We have them weight every factor. This allows us to create a hierarchy. Physical activity, if he didn't get up 
or if he stayed sitting too long, this was another big trigger. This was particularly uh, uh, related to driving uh, or maybe missing a running day because of rain or COVID, uh, poor sleep, et cetera, et cetera. These add up to 42 points working against them. From an alleviating factor standpoint, again, this is before practical health care, um, after the medical system, after he'd seen the spine surgeon, um, was kind of given the conservative advice with option for surgery if it gets worse. Um, he said, if I stood up, my pain goes away. That physical activity helps, but I can't go to PT and there's too much. I don't do it at home because I have time constraints. So it wasn't as effective, but he had 30 points working for him. So of course, this is going to progress and get worse. He has more things working against him than for him. Next, we have the patient develop that sense of confidence and control. What's within your control? What can you stop doing right now? He said, not pushing through the pain. Pretty, pretty profound, yet simple. What's one thing that you can start doing? Well, I could stand up when the pain occurs rather than pushing through it. Again, we've created patients who are recipients of care where they wait until something bad happens and then go in. This is a novel concept. <laughs> um, so standing up something that simple started to help them. When you start expanding that circle of control and focusing on what's within your control, your circle of influence expands. So rather than focusing on his sleep, posture, and mental health, which is what we do as a system, which feels outside of the control, those things improve naturally by default of taking care of the root cause. Lastly, there are things outside of patient's control. He can't do anything about his prior spine surgery and the doctor saying you have adjacent segment disease. He can't really stand up to his boss and say, I can't drive as much. He could, but he doesn't have that confidence. And he also said, I can't say no to surgery if that's what the doctor's recommending. So this is where we focused as a system are things outside of his control. But by putting the patient back to empower them to focus on what's within their control, this influence expands. And we see something happen. We see cascading happen. That things downstream will improve by addressing the upstream problem. So this is after practical healthcare's methodology, after that discovery phase. Remember the points, 42 points working against 34. After our method, 19 points working against 43 Four. So again, prolonged sitting was his number one problem, but standing alleviated the pain. He started standing up when he felt pain, when he felt pressure, when he felt tension. He also developed a lot of other tools that were brainstormed from other people going through the same experience he did that he could trial and error. Lastly, this patient uh, started sharing his success with others. He started coaching the people who were avoiders, who were talkers. And he said, my body has a voice, not just my mind. If something feels wrong, don't ignore it. Listen to what your body's telling you. For me, it was as simple as standing up when I first felt pain. So this is crowdsourcing. He's sharing something on social media that have worked for him in his situation. We're trying to empower that concept in a safe way. So here's a patient-driven control plan or care plan. Ralph kind of started in this pain intolerable red dot section where it was so bad he went into the doctors and was told he needed surgery. But there's another option. He could stand up or stop driving. He noticed that when he started doing those things, the pain changed, that it became tolerable. When you realize that you are in control of your outcomes, that you have control over that, that you connect the dots between what you put in connects to what comes out, he realized that he could start trialing other things that were recommended to him from friends and family and, and strangers. So when the pain was tolerable, he would ball smash and work on those tight muscles. He'd do some piriformis stretching or use a floss band. Then he realized that before the pain could be labeled as pain, he felt tension and pressure. And he developed some interventions that worked for those things. Lastly, he also got some influence and in, uh, education around how to prevent this progression. He's an avid runner. Someone shared with him that there's a concept of running called chi running. He had stored a lot of pain in his back from his prior surgery. Somatic experience therapy helped with that. 
this opened up a whole new world. And he had no clue about these resources because no one had ever told him. Hmm. Crowdsourcing solutions is what's going on right now on social media. We have to harness this. Our results, we've had now over 200 patients go through our methodology with a 97% adherence to their treatment plans, a two times increase in their health confidence using the health confidence score, and 95% of patients engaging in recommending crowdsourced solutions. Outcomes wise, we've seen a four times increase in return to work in any capacity. I'll share a story on that next, and a 44% reduction in disability. That might seem like a lot, but remember that 50% of health outcomes are due to everyday life factors. We're incorporating those into care plans. Lastly, patients enjoy this method because it improves their quality of life because we're doing it around their values, their goals, what's meaningful to them. The majority of these uh, um, results come from the workers' comp population, but we've also done it in a caregiving population for newly diagnosed type 1 diabetics, a senior living population, as well as college and high school students. So a quick story to wrap up. Um, patient who was a driver for our stadium here in town called the Yum Center, sponsored by KFC. That's where Louisville uh, is where KFC's headquarters is in Louisville. But we're a college sports town. Uh, we don't have any professional sports. And this man was a driver for the uh, Yum Center for the basketball teams. He was a 69-year-old male who was Muhammad Ali's ring boy growing up. His wife had passed away. He had very little family, uh, but he loved this job. It allowed him to tell his stories and have a purpose. He had a fall and hit his head and suffered a concussion. He went into the ER and was discharged home, but over the weekend, he had a comorbidity of AFib, and his AFib kicked in from the stress. He threw a clot and went blind in his right eye. So I saw this patient a year later. After he had gone through the healthcare system, workers' comp said the, the blindness isn't related to your fall. Um, doctor said there's nothing more we can do, um, that this is kind of the as-is condition, your maximum improvement. And now he's at home, not working, no family, limited social network, and he's depressed. He's isolated. This story really resonates after going through COVID. So after I declared my medical um, uh, take from the legal perspective for him, um, I said, would you like to try to see if you can help yourself get better? And he said, I don't understand. I said, well, let's just start with who you are as a person. What are your values? His number one value is faith. What are your hobbies? Sabi's reading the Bible, but he couldn't because of the difficulty with his vision. He didn't have the means to go out and realize that there's large print Bibles or handicap uh, accessible Bibles. So he was at home alone without his favorite hobby, not living his values, mental health disrupting his, um, his pursuit of going to church every week. He was a shell of who he was. He lost his humanity because of this disease, and we never treated that. Now that's gonna be very difficult for the healthcare system to treat. So we need to empower patients to at least start that process. So by connecting him with others who had faith as a number one value, they started taking care of each other. Hey, here's a large print Bible. Let me drop it off for you. Or let me share a PDF for you. Hey, I have a service. I'm gonna come pick you up and bring you to it. He found a community. That man who lost his job as a driver is now an interim preacher a year after his injury. And that's a beautiful tale of um, patient-driven healthcare. So key takeaways, personal narratives are at the forefront. We have to remember that there's a power of and. We need to incorporate those into our care plans. Patients have been trained to self-reflect only when ill and determine how, do, how does all of this confusion, this overwhelm fit into me while they're sick? We're very poor at doing that. And that's because the system is uh, disease centric, but also system centric. We refer out to other elements of the system, but not really empower internally. So let's reclaim true value-based healthcare using these Lean Six Sigma tools by delivering them to the patients in a method that's in their language that empowers them to take control and results in empowerment through democ uh, democratization of, of resources. Patients sharing what works given a lived experience. 
This results in self-advocacy and downstream safety. So I really appreciate the, uh, the chance to speak with you guys, uh, some QR codes to follow me on LinkedIn, reach out there or, or visit our website. But um, been a wonderful panel and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Unfortunately, we actually don't have time for questions, but <laughs> hopefully um, if people want to reach out to you all, you can put your um, contact in the chat or um, people can also always reach out to me. I'm so grateful, Dr. Nazar, for um, your sharing what, uh, if, what the power of learning from engineering, how you took that and translated that into your knowledge from uh, as a doctor and how you were able to integrate and learn from a different discipline, translate it and apply it into this new concept and new way of thinking about healthcare and the ways in which perhaps all of us listening today, um, how we can learn from other disciplines and internalize that and what that might possibly mean in terms of the way we rethink the work that we're doing as well and how we can learn from other disciplines. The notion of uh, thinking about patient safety, the notion of thinking about the wellness from a broader, more interdisciplinary and collaborative care. Deeply grateful, um, Dr. Goldberg, Mark, Dr. Nazar, um, Dr. Hawker, who's uh, watching this on video um, after, and um, to everyone who's joined us. We have only 12 minutes left. And so um, I'm going to unfortunately have to continue on, but uh, perhaps if people want to put in the chat questions, um, Dr. Nazar, um, Dr. Goldberg and Mark can answer some of those things. There have been a few comments that have already happened. Uh, this is really about where do how do we create low um, create better care, better outcomes, safer care by learning from people who have different approaches. Whether it's looking at economic theory, whether it's looking at engineering principles, whether it's looking at how how could social work learn from medical care? How could medicine learn from social work? How could all of us learn from different disciplines? Um, and most importantly, how can we listen to the voice of the people we're serving, whether we call them customers, whether we call them patients, whether we call them service users, each person's voice has a unique perspective. And that brings us to our final point that I'm going to share. So um, if we just continue for a few more minutes, I am so excited. What we want to really encourage people to do is Think about how can we take all of our different perspectives and see that we each want something similar, um, whether it's safe for healthcare, whether it's harm reduction, whether it's culturally safe and responsive and diverse services, whether it's looking at the integration of collaborative care as it's exam exemplified in palliative care, what could we look like, look at in terms of healthcare that is embedded into community. We all have a vision. Um, you know, Dr. Nazar talked about um, how do we empower and, and look at creating advocates. And he really looked at taking each person with whom we work, not everyone's an advocate at start, but how do we look at that process of helping people move to an advocacy, self-advocacy perspective by focusing upon what is their root cause, their root why, their root goals. So we see people and sometimes we see only what seems to be an obstacle or a barrier to their participating in care, but it turns out that in that beautiful example that Dr. Nazar gave, that it was really, um, that he was, that at the core, it was because they were concerned about their loved one, their mother, they were caregivers. So how can we, look at um, working together to address some of the barriers that people experience that impact their ability to get care. And it could be systemic bias. It could be the fact that they need peer support, which is something that we looked at yesterday when we had a uh, lunch and learn looking at the importance of peer support to address intersectional bias and systemic racism and um, 
uh, prejudice. It could be needing collaborative care. It could be embedded community care to be trauma-informed and patient-centered. It could be the lack of safety principles. Whatever it is that we want to see, um, this is part of our um, advocacy at the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers, looking at we all people are more than a diagnosis and wanting to see strategic investment in the social determinants of health and well-being, wanting to see at the very minimum 10% of health funding dedicated to mental health and addictions, wanting to see family-centered and client-centered, patient-centered, service user-centered practice and service delivery, and wanting to see increased accessibility and appropriateness of services for diverse communities. These are just the beginning of the things we wanna see. But this is part of our vision for advocacy at the college and mark your calendars for March 25th uh, 2024 for our third advocacy day. What if all of us, we are 3000 social workers. What if all of us got at least five people to at the very same time, ask our elected representatives for exactly the same thing. So this is an example of one of the things that I learned from Mark, who's um, engineering Six Sigma processes. How can we transform our approach to advocacy? And how all of you that have been listening to um, some of these professionals speaking, you're going to have to translate what you heard into your lived experience and practice. But what can you be doing to bring together the people on your team to think creatively about coming up with solutions? Um, this is part of our vision for how we translate the moral distress that was identified amongst our members um, that is reflected in the repositioning report that identifies that 98% of social workers experience severe moral distress and how do we translate that into advocacy. Each of you witness a lot of problems in your respective areas. What are the solutions that you see? Each of us have unique positionality and unique perspectives that need to be heard. And that is where we have created this, um, this uh, new and improved, today is the launch date for our new Advocacy Day um, toolkit. So many of you know our Advocacy Toolkit. We have a new and improved version of it with graphics to make it easier to use, less words. I'm gonna share this video just to show you a little bit about this toolkit that is getting ready to come out. Um, and you'll get a link to it at your next newsletter, um, but you get to see the first draft of it here because each person's voice matters and that's part of healing. What if as part of the way people come to us and they're struggling, they're depressed about their, the housing crisis, about racism, about systemic injustice, about the lack of investment in our communities, about the lack of prevention services, the lack of collaborative care, we got to see a lot of those. What if when people come to us and they say they're depressed, instead of simply giving them cognitive behavioral therapy, we worked with them to help them create a treatment plan that included talking to their MLA, their elected representative. What if that was part of their healing because we believe in the structural determinants of health and we know that housing is health so we put as part of their treatment plan, writing a letter to their elected representative as part of how they are able to heal from depression that is caused by structural influences. So this is one way of possibly translating some of these principles. I bet each of you have your own ways and hopefully you'll join some of our committees, our social justice committee, our communications committee, so that we can together transform the way healthcare and social services are delivered here in unceded Mi'kmaq. We're excited to introduce We Have Power, a toolkit for engaging with your MLA and using your voice for change. We Have Power is a toolkit that was created in partnership between the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers and the Legal Information Society of Nova Scotia. This guide includes tips about effective communication, sample advocacy letters, and other resources so you can feel empowered to use your voice for change. 
We all deserve to have our voices heard. We can do this by letting our government representatives know what matters to us and our communities. Together, we can make a difference and build a better Nova Scotia for everyone. And so this is a little bit of, it's got templates and letters. Um, we will be having it again in the libraries all across Nova Scotia um, so that you can uh, contact your MLA. You can pick some up and work with the people that you're working with in your community, in your organization, because this is part of how we address some of the structural issues that we have recognized are part of uh, the wellness outcomes, the safety outcomes that um, we are working together to do. And this is part of how we affirm that everyone's voice matters and everyone's perspective matters. So we talked a little bit about um, some of these ideas and concerns and ways of addressing health and wellness. And uh, with that, um, I am grateful to each of you, grateful to Dr. Nazar, Dr. Goldberg, Mark, and Dr. Hawker for sharing some of their wisdom. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, technically, our, our, our conference is done. This was our first safety conference. We got to hear about safety on many different levels, whether it's decolonizing our idea of safety, recognizing that this blame and shame culture contributes to some of the problems that are impacting us, whether it's looking at the safety registry and um, Alec shared a little bit about ways we are trying to transform the way we think about regulation of healthcare and social work, whether it's looking at mentorship and the candidacy process as a way of trying to improve outcomes, or whether it's looking at collaborative care and how can we as social workers learn from our colleagues, whether they're doctors, whether they're engineers, whether they live in Nova Scotia or whether they live south of the colonial border, all the way in Kentucky, um, everyone has something to teach us. And one of the things that um, I was most touched by when I got to work with Mark and Dr. Goldberg um, in several hospitals is that we put patients first and the patient family advisory committee was in our redesign. So when we redesigned the process, they were the ones that were saying, when I go through um, this patient, the emergency department, I feel scared, I feel unsafe. And their voice was the one that was helping us redesign. And then we used metrics to make sure that we were reporting back to them what makes, what changes we were doing. Um, Dr. Nazar talked about how um, use of technology can really transform. Uh, and Dr. Goldberg talked about the transforming of our systems so that we make the right way, the easy way. Um, so grateful to all of you and thank you so very much. And may today be the beginning of safer care for all people in unceded Mi'kmaq and across Turtle Island. Gratitude to you all. I'm going to stop recording, but if uh, we want to have any informal conversation, we can do that. But for all of you joining us on YouTube, thank you so much uh, for joining us and may we have safer outcomes. <laughs>